Uh, my name is Deborah Gonzalez, and I'm the Government Affairs Director here at PPIC, at the Public Policy Institute of California. And, and we want to thank you for coming out here today on what feels like one of our first fall days. And it's pretty exciting in Sacramento when it's under 100. Um, PPIC has recently released a report titled Key Factors in Arrest Trends and Differences in California Counties, which is authored by Magnus Lofstrom, Brandon Martin, Joe Hayes, who are all here today, and a, a adjunct fellow, Stephen Raphael. We'd like to thank the Arnold Ventures, for, uh, thank Arnold Ventures for their support of this work. You should have received a copy of the report on your chair. There are additional copies at the registration desk. Uh, the report, technical appendices, we, we have a pretty detailed technical appendix, um, and slides are available from today's presentation all online at ppic.org. For today's program, you're going to first hear from Brandon, who will present the main findings of the report. Then Magnus will moderate a discussion with fantastic panelists, and we really appreciate you taking the time to come here. And finally, we should have plenty of uh, time for questions and answers. Uh, we are video broadcasting this to a live audience and then for our website, so please wait for the microphones to come before you ask your question. A couple of things before we begin. Later today, you'll receive a short survey via email, and we ask that you will take a few moments to let us know how we did. And lastly, please turn off your cell phones. <laughs> Protecting residents from crime is a core government function. It goes without saying, our public safety system is strengthened when it operates equitably. The report you will hear about today is a second report in a multi-year project looking at arrest data from 1980 to 2016. An important part of this project has been the creation of an advisory committee. Our advisory committee is comprised of representatives from law enforcement, community reform advocates, and the Department of Justice, and we want to thank the these the folks on the team for taking the time and the commitment to be part of our advisory project. The conversations with the advisory committee have been inspiring on so many levels. First, there is obvious shared goal of improving public safety. Second, there is an interest in understanding the facts. Getting to common facts is not as simple <laughs> as it seems, even with such an expansive data set. The group had long discussions about data, the data sets we use, its strengths, and most importantly, its weaknesses. And I want you to know they had some very encouraging conversation about efforts at the local level to improve equity as well as public safety. So while analyzing data is important to people like PPIC, we're data nerds who are a think tank, the constructive dialogue this project has inspired is at least, in my view, a more important part of this project. And now on with the program, so please help me welcome Brandon. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, I just want to re reiterate, like Deborah said, this is the second report that we've come out with in, in a two-year uh, study on arrest in California. Our first report came out last December, and we had a corresponding event. You can get all of those materials online as well. And the two-year project, um, wouldn't be what it is today without uh, the generous support of Arnold Ventures, so we'd like to thank them as well. So we know that law enforcement across the state of California make more than a million arrests each year. And arrests have wide-ranging consequences. Uh, there's, there's a, a risk, risk of injury to both the officer and the suspect during the arrest. A suspect's life can change from that arrest. And also, uh, arrests are a use of um, very valuable public resources. And especially if the individual is arrested and booked into county jail, that can take the officer off the street for a, a large amount of time during their shift, and then also has consequences down the road for jail capacity and, and other resources within the criminal justice system. Uh, over the last five to 10 years, there has been uh, increasing discussions about law enforcement interactions with their community and racial disparity in, in those interactions. Our work last December showed that there are wide variances in arrest rates and also wide variances in the racial disparity in arrest rates across the state. And so in this piece, we go beyond that sort of fact setting uh, report that we had last December and we more closely examine the statewide arrest trends as well as differences in arrest rates and racial disparities across counties in California 
looking specifically to what relationship there might be with other factors beyond just the discretion of law enforcement officers in making an arrest. And so specifically, we'll be looking at three areas that I'm going to cover over the next few minutes. We look at uh, the role of crime rates and the relationship of crime rates. We look at some recent criminal justice reforms and their relationship to the change in arrest rates. And then finally, we go to look at county level factors uh, beyond those mentioned that might have a relationship with arrest rates. And so I'm talking about uh, the demographics of a county, uh, the economic conditions of a county, and also criminal justice resources of a county uh, that we'll be looking at. Like Deborah mentioned, our arrest data goes from 1980 to 2016. And so uh, the figure shows that arrests and crime rates over that time period, um, while peaking in the early 1990s, uh, at late 1980s, early 1990s, have actually been on the decline, both the overall arrest rate and the overall crime rate in the state of California. Uh, they they, and they actually track pretty closely to each other. Uh, they're not exact. Um, our arrest data that we're using from the Depart California Department of Justice is actually more specific than the crime data that we're using for this figure. So the crime data uh, doesn't, isn't capturing as many of the crimes that actually our arrest data is capturing for for arrest. Uh, but you can see they, they, they pretty closely track each other. And, and, and that could be expected. Officers uh, need to have probable cause that a, a crime has occurred to, to make an arrest. And so you could see as uh, changes in arrest, uh, changes in crime rates uh, sort of drive the response of law enforcement in sort of the overall arrest rates. It is worthy to note that recently, since 2010, the arrest rates continue uh, to decline uh, steadily, but we have seen some fluctuation in the crime rates, and specifically some increases year to year in the violent crime rates uh, statewide in California. So what we do here is we try to take a look at what exactly that relationship is between crime rates and arrest rates, looking at the statewide numbers. And what this figure is showing you is the percent of the variation that can be explained by crime rates uh, in the variation of arrest rates over time. And so what sort of share of the variation does crime rates account for in that relationship with uh, arrest rates over time? And we can see that uh, statewide trends in arrest rates are uh, largely driven by changes in, in crime rates. So when you look at all arrests, the all arrest rate, 90% uh, of that variation from over time in the arrest rate uh, can be attributed to crime rates. And when you look specifically at um, specific uh, crimes of arrest, uh, types of arrest, we even see that holds true as well for both fi vi felony violent and property and also misdemeanor violent and property. And so there is a strong effect statewide of the relationship between crime rates uh, and arrest rates. But like I mentioned uh, a couple slides ago, since 2010, uh, that relationship isn't as strong as what it had been in the past. And so we wanted to take a look at how uh, recent criminal justice reforms may have affected uh, uh, the overall arrest rate in the state of California. And so we specifically focus on two reforms. Uh, some of you may have uh, know quite a bit about them, but I'm just going to sort of briefly summarize uh, the reforms. Uh, first, we look at public safety realignment, which the state enacted in uh, late 2011. What public safety realignment did is it uh, realigned or uh, changed uh, the correctional co control of a class of offenders here in the state from state control to down to the county level uh, for control, uh, correctional control. Proposition 47 was passed by voters in late 2014, and what that did was it reclassified uh, several property and drug offenses from being uh, the possibility of being a felony to only being a misdemeanor, and so it reclassified a number of offenses. And what we see is that after uh, public safety realignment went into effect in late 2011, uh, we observed that the overall arrest rate statewide dropped by about 7%, which also equals uh, roughly uh, 300 fewer arrests per 100,000 residents uh, across the state. After Proposition 47, we saw an additional decline of roughly 11%, which translates into roughly 440 fewer arrests uh, per 100,000 residents in terms of the crime rate. For public safety realignment, most of that drop is actually driven by uh, a decrease in misdemeanor traffic and alcohol-related offenses. And correspondingly, for Proposition 47, we see that most of the drop 
uh, after Proposition 47 was driven by a decrease in felony drug and property uh, arrests, which would make sense considering that's sort of what the, the measure did uh, it, it with state law. Our previous work has showed that there is wide variation uh, across counties. So moving from the statewide arrest rates to looking at the arrest rates across our 58 counties, you see that uh, the counties with the highest arrest rates uh, arrest two to three times more people than uh, individual than counties with the lowest arrest rates. Uh, we also looked at the role that crime rates can play in changes and variation across counties in terms of the arrest rates, which is what I've shown you with the statewide level. And it's not as strong as what, what we find with the statewide level, but it still can account for roughly 75% of the variation uh, across county arrest rates. And so crime rates are also playing a role um, when we look down at the county level in that variation of uh, county arrest rates. So we also want to look at a number of factors. And like I mentioned before, we look at demographics. So we're going to look at the relationship between uh, the racial and ethnic makeup of counties, uh, the age of uh, the citizens of the county, and, and how that relates to arrest rates. We're also going to look at measures such as poverty, um, unemployment rate, uh, number of individuals with a uh, college degree, uh, median household income as well. And then finally, we're going to look at uh, criminal justice resources and, and their relationship with arrest rates. And what we look at is jail capacity and, and law enforcement staffing because that's uh, the most readily available data uh, that we have. And so what do we find when we're looking at just the variation across counties and, and arrest rate? We find that counties with higher arrest rates tend to have poorer economic conditions, lower shares of non-white residents, higher shares of young adults, uh, a lower population density, so they tend to be more rural. And they also have a higher jail capacity per 100,000 residents compared to counties that have low arrest rates. Uh, it is worth noting that once you control for these factors that I've talked about, while there is a difference uh, in the arrest rates and their relationship with law enforcement officers per 100,000 100, residents, that doesn't actually uh, become statistically significant when you're controlling for the other factors that I've mentioned. Now looking more specifically at racial disparities in arrest rates across counties um, and across statewide, we know from our previous work that um, the, the, the African-American arrest rate um, is three times higher than what it is for the white arrest rate uh, statewide. And so what, 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 we're, what we're talking about here is basically the ratio of of the African-American arrest rate to the white arrest rate. And so that would be a, a ratio of, of three to one. Um, but when you go and look across counties, you see an even wider variation um, in that ratio compared to the statewide rate. And so the counties with the highest uh, uh, disparity in African-American arrest rate to white arrest rate, uh, it, it's nearly six times what it is. The African-American arrest rate is nearly six times what it is for the white uh, arrest rate. And even the counties with the lowest disparities you see uh, in arrest rate, that's two times um, what it is for uh, the white arrest rate. And so looking at this figure, uh, we're comparing now the um, a, a racial disparity uh, ratio between African Americans and, and whites with their arrest rate, and looking at it how it varies by the poverty rate of a, a county. And so we're trying to add in uh, another factor that might have a relationship with arrest rates. And so if you look up in the, uh, if you're looking at the upper left-hand corner of the figure, you can see that the vertical axis is giving the African American to white uh, arrest rate ratio that I talked about previously. And so the, in the, the counties that are in the upper left-hand corner, the dots in the upper left-hand corner of the slide, uh, have a very high um, uh, arrest rate ratio, but at the same time have a, a, a low poverty rate for their county. And so as you move along the horizontal axis to the right, um, you see that as, poverty, as the poverty rate increases in a county, the overall uh, ratio, arrest ratio declines. And so there's actually a, a negative uh, relationship between um, those two variables. And finally, just to, to reiterate sort of that, it, it really is what we're seeing in this data is there is a relationship between um, larger, dis larger racial disparities and, and more affluent counties. 
And so like I've shown you before with the poverty rate, uh, counties with a low poverty rate have a high uh, racial disparity uh, ratio. That also holds for um, the number of college graduates sort of in the reverse. So the more college graduates we, we see in a county, um, the higher racial disparity uh, ratio that we see for African Americans compared to whites. And also that holds uh, the same for uh, the median household income of, of, of a county. And so this figure is showing, um, looking at uh, low disparity counties, low disparity, the lowest disparity counties and also then the highest disparity counties, the share of population for each uh, category. And so we can see there are um, fewer African Americans in high disparity counties. Uh, like I've shown in the last slide, there are um, less people in poverty in those counties, and then there's also a higher number of college graduates in those counties. So that's the high level uh, <coughs> items that I've pulled out from the report. So to conclude, um, crime rates are a major factor in arrest rates, both at, at the state level, statewide level, and also when you look across counties. Um, after the public safety realignment and Proposition 47, we saw, we observed a decline in the arrest rates after both of those, 7% after public safety realignment, and then an additional 11% after Proposition 47. When we start to look at those county level factors and the relationship they might have with the variance of arrest rates across counties, we find that counties with the highest arrest rates tend to have poorer economic conditions but when you look at actually the relationship with racial disparity, uh, counties with the largest racial disparities tend to be ra relatively affluent. And so one, one takeaway from this um, report and the findings of the report that will be talked about uh, next in the panel is um, while a lot of the conversation between law enforcement and community interactions may have focused on uh, poor urban areas, uh, the information that we've shown would uh, lead one to believe that if, if policymakers and practitioners uh, want to um, make strides in, in uh, solving the racial disparity, they would also want to pay attention to wealthier areas beyond just the, the poor urban areas. So thank you very much. At this time, I would like to invite our moderator, Magnus, up and also our panelists. All right, uh, thank you, Brandon. We get our uh, panelists up here and I will introduce them. Uh, I wanna thank you all for coming here today. Um, and we have a fantastic panel here. We are very fortunate. Um, on my right, furthest down there, I have um, Todd Sockman. He is the chief of police uh, for the city of Galt. In the middle here, we have Dr. Dr. Shirley Weber. She is assembly member, as well as chair of the assembly budget subcommittee on um, public safety. And then closest to me here, I have J. Edgar Boyd. He is pastor of the First African Methodist Episcopal Church. So we welcome you all. Thank, Thank you so you. much. <laughs> All right, so let's get started here. Um, one of the things that the, uh, the report and, and the findings that Brandon shared with us here today uh, makes clear is that there is um, widespread racial disparity in arrests in, in California. Um, so what I wanna ask our panelists here is from, from your perspective, what are the consequences of racial disparity in arrests? And uh, mistrust of law enforcement is, is one example of that. So what happens when a community uh, mistrusts law enforcement? Um, Chief, do you wanna start our conversation here? Or? Well, I, I think that's a, an interesting question. We, um, in law enforcement, we spend a great deal of time in our outreach efforts to our communities. Uh, each individual, municipality or sheriff's department uh, spends time within their own community to try to establish relationships. And so uh, I think that's key uh, to everything that we're doing uh, because I, quite honestly, there's a, um, there's a narrative out there. Um, in my professional opinion, uh, there is some false narrative and there's uh, a very narrow narrative on um, 
some of the things that are being said about uh, our profession and uh, our relationships. And but while there's that narrative out there, I think it's imperative that we as law enforcement agencies uh, provide our own narrative also. Um, so we have to go out there and have those one on one conversations, those group conversations uh, to, so that we can uh, make sure that there is that level of trust. Uh, speaking for uh, myself and my community, um, I, I, that's, that's a chunk of my time is making sure that I've, I have those relationships um, so that when there is questions or when there's something questionable or if there's something that comes up, uh, not only uh, in my region but in the state, um, I have community leaders and groups that can come and reach out uh, to me and uh, we can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and sometimes we agree and sometimes we disagree, but that's okay because like with any relationships, that's that's important to have those dialogues. Uh, so, thanks, Dr. Weber. Um, first of all, I, I I appreciate the the research that's been done and and uh, appreciate this conversation. I want to say uh, most of you know I'm in another meeting at this time, and so. Uh, I'll be here for a short period of time before I have to go back to the State Board of Education. But um, this data is, is, I have to let you, let you know, this data is not new. It's nice and research is here and, and gives us more guidance. But if you live in the African American community, you know the data is not new. It is, it is something that community has lived with. And so as a result, it does have some very negative consequences. Uh, the idea that uh, that, you, if, that if you commit an offense, you're more likely to be arrested and incarcerated as a result of that offense rather than just being picked up and talked to, as, as folks think about it. Um, that the consequences in terms of other things like employment and family stability and all those things are highly affected by the fact that you've been arrested and, and obviously incarcerated. So those things also impact your life in, in terms of that. The likelihood that um, the constant the contact or the over-contact also may mean that you're probably, as a community, at a higher risk of finding yourselves in a confrontation, much more than just simply an arrest, but in a confrontation because of the attitudes people have that they're always being arrested, they're always being harassed, they're always being seen, and therefore the numbers therefore increase, which means you're more likely to engage in, in some unfortunate confront confrontation with law enforcement, uh, which makes you at risk for being hurt or, or killed. And we see that happening in the state. So the, the idea that this happens is extremely important that we look at it carefully. Uh, the perception that folks have that these, that African Americans are more violent individuals. I was on a panel recently with with uh, Cop West, I think it was, or something in there, kind of, and someone from New York says, well, that's because blacks are much more violent, and as a result, they commit more crimes. And uh, and yet, we've seen violent activities occur in other communities, and yet the, 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 the handling of that is very different than what is handled in the African American community. So clearly, there's, a, there's an issue here when you're six times more likely to be arrested than in some other communities. Uh, much more watched in affluent communities than in poor communities. Uh, we've seen that in, in sometimes in litigations where people who've lived in affluent communities, uh, like the gentleman in La Jolla in San Diego, a very affluent community, who was an engineer, I think, and he loved to walk. And he's, as a result, he was forever being arrested uh, and stopped because he didn't carry ID. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, this whole idea of that uh, you're going to be a suspect, and you, if you live in those communities, even when you live in those communities, you're going to find yourself being stopped more as if to say your type is not really desired here, <coughs> wanted here, and so forth and so on. And so so those things happen because that's the nature of the culture of that community and how they want to maintain the homogeneity of that, com of that community versus trying to increase its diversity that's there. So it has serious consequences. And, and uh, you know, looking at a, an arrest rate that's six times more likely uh, to be arrested than someone else, probably for the same offense, uh, it once again speaks to the, our continuing need for a discussion of, of uh, police bias. Uh, basically those kinds of things that are happening regularly. Uh, I, the Ripper Board is, lo is looking at the things that are taking place in terms of trying to give us a perspective of what we need to do in order to change the constant stopping and eventually the arrest of people of color. Thank you, Dr. Weber. Mm -hmm. Pastor Boyd? Yeah, if we don't consider the institutions of community that are important and viable to that particular community, one would understand that Anytime anything negative happens that impacts those individual or those collective communities, that there's going to be uh, a re relative uh, impact on negativity across the board. 
if there's six times uh, more likely African Americans or black people to be arrested than, than white counterparts, then you can probably multiply the same impact on institutions, institutions of homes, of schools, uh, of worship institutions, and uh, community organizations, and, and, and the like. Uh, young children uh, whose lives are very fragile in developmental stages, uh, the absence of, of a parent uh, at home continually intensifies the uh, effort of them to survive and, and to make their own way uh, in a very hostile and uh, very oppressive situation and, and matter. When we begin to look at uh, the disparity uh, between the percentages of, of those who are arrested in the African American community uh, as opposed to others, it comes back and it it parallels a lot of other things that happen along the line, too. Uh, if you look at the income um, uh, of African-American families, the, the, the net asset, uh, or at least the bottom line economic power of an African-American family as compared to a white American family across the country. Uh, white Americans, um, just about 10 times uh, uh, the liquidity of <clears throat> African American families, and that's pretty much across the the country. So that means uh, that there's going to be a negative impact across the lines. Likewise, African American families will be less, uh, will be ten times less likely to be able to afford um, uh, the tuition of the school, or ten times likely uh, to be, or ten times less likely to be able to afford down payment on a home uh, and 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 the like. If there is uh, that kind of disparity, and that there is, and that there is that kind of disparity, it, it overflows. It relates uh, across the lines. If an African American goes to uh, apply for a job, uh, aside from the uh, qualifications, aside from uh, the test scores in those situations where testing is done, mm -hmm. if there is a gray area, that African American will be looked at in a different way than a white American would be looked. That's just plain and simple uh, across the line. Um, if they're actually um, going to apply for uh, a loan for financing of a house, even though uh, the income, the income to debt ratio uh, all meets the same, if it then becomes the uh, possibility of that person who reviews the loan to look at them uh, and make some judgment uh, without the, the written uh, documentation qualifications, it's probably going to be a negative impact. So uh, when that happens, uh, it happens across the board. It's an impact that uh, ripples across every line, every uh, uh, sector within the African American community. Thank you. Um, the legislature recently passed bills aimed at limiting law enforcement use of uh, force, uh, AB 392, as well as providing <coughs> officers with new training, so that's SB 230. Um, beyond this, uh, what role can and should the state serve in addressing issues around arrest, including racial disparity, or uh, is this primarily a local issue? And, and then also, what, what role can community-based organizations uh, play here. Uh, Assemblymember Weber, do you mind starting us off? Why not? Um, <laughs> <laughs> since I started the discussion, huh, 392. Um, That's right. I, I think we all have a responsibility. I, I think it, it would be irresponsible of us as legislators to simply believe that the, the challenge is at the local level. And in fact, it's interesting to me, as we passed 392, there were a number of law enforcement officers who, who spoke with me privately that they were pleased that 392 passed because some of the things <clears throat> we were, they were attempting to do at a local level was stymied by their, by their officers and, their, and those who didn't want to do anything. And therefore, they had ideas of working to de-escalate and so forth and so on. And now this, this bill says we got to do it and so they can blame it on me. And that's okay, uh, you know, because sometimes there are things at the local level that prevent you from moving in a direction like your job and keeping your job. And so having, having 392 as an overlay becomes important to empower the local individuals to do what they know is best and will and we'll continue to work to, to accomplish that. So I think we all have a responsibility. Uh, and once these bills are passed, the legislature, we have responsibility to fund it, which we're doing, uh, to fund those efforts. We started last year before the bill was even uh, was passed to begin to increase funding for de-escalation because we have a responsibility to do that. Once we set those standards, that become important because that's what we can evaluate ourselves as well as, uh, as, well as officers and the local jurisdictions can evaluate themselves by whether or not they've engaged in some level of de-escalation and the training that needs to occur. So we have a responsibility to follow through it. And we always have a responsibility to make sure that the accounting is occurring and the data 
is there and that if necessary, we need to tweak it, alter it, uh, continue to work on it. And the locals have equal responsibility to make sure that they're doing due diligence uh, to take care of this issue. So it's not a pass on to anyone. Uh, AB 593, the other bill, racial profiling bill on the RIPA committee, we're still involved with that, with the, at least my office is still involved with the, with the uh, racial profiling bill uh, in terms of not only working with the RIPA committee, but working with our, our, our district attorney and our attorney generals to make sure that they are diligent about what they're doing and taking place. And we have to provide the continuing oversight, I think, as a legislature, to, to make sure that those, that those bills are diligently uh, implemented in ways that, uh, that have some uh, due diligence with regards to our responsibility to be there, and they're being implemented with some fidelity so that there is clearly what we intend is taking place. So I don't take uh, my responsibility as a legislator as make a bill walk away. You know, my staff makes a bill and we continue to monitor and monitor and monitor and make sure that we put the resources in it and those kinds of things to get the success that we want. Thank you. Pastor Boyd. Thank you. Right. Um, when you look at communities and look at the um, conflict that exists between communities and law enforcement across the state, uh, you, you'll find that there's a possibility of lessening that, that negativity or the, the negative impact if, if it's worked on. Uh, African Americans uh, are not more violent than uh, white Americans. Uh, African Americans do not have a propensity to violence and criminality more than in any other ethnic group in, in the community. Uh, the implicit bias that somehow or another uh, um, supports the notion that that exists uh, is part of the, the problem that we're having to deal with and unlearn and, and, and tool down and uh, tool away from. Um, with uh, officers and law enforcement reaching out to members of the community, having a conversation, having dialogue, making sure children uh, begin to interact and interface with law enforcement officers, make sure law enforcement officers uh, who have a contact daily uh, uh, with community members take time to spend time, not in their official role as a law enforcement officer, but perhaps shooting, shooting hoops, uh, perhaps having a conversation, perhaps being at some of the community organizations as they uh, hold events, churches and mosques and others within the community, so that, that uh, relationship is being uh, built upon and being expanded. Uh, once the law enforcement officer begins to know uh, a member of the community uh, more in depth, I think a lot of the implicit bias uh, begins to be unlearned and, un and, and unhinged at that point in time. And as that continues, then it becomes lesser and lesser and lesser of, of a problem. So having that uh, uh, in place, I think, goes a long way in helping to overcome uh, some of the disparities that, that, that take place. If we can do that, then I, I think we'll be moving toward uh, a time when the numbers and the statistics not only will go down, but the disparities will also go down. The numbers uh, of, of events are going down, but the disparity is not going down. We need the disparity to go down at the same time. Chief Sockman? I appreciate what he just said, because I think that that's right. We need to make sure that we have those relationships. Um, I think there's a couple things that are really important to, um, to mention. So when we're talking about arrests, uh, that could lead to um, um, encounters where there's uses of force. Um, I did some polling up and down the state in preparation for this uh, meeting. And what we found was in some uh, departments, or most, almost all the departments I talked to, there's a greater than 50 to 80 percent rate that um, when an arrest is made, it's made as a result of a call for service. It's not an on view. It's not an officer taking that um, uh, initial call. That is an officer responding to a citizen making a uh, complaint or a concern. So, you know, so we go out and respond and, and, and uh, it was said that probable cause is the way that we make an arrest and or if there's an, a warrant in the system. And so uh, that that is important to mention um, so because it wasn't in the report uh, when I when I read it and so we want to make sure we have that so the, talking about the uses of force um, uh, 392 uh, it was a it was a long process I think it was there was a lot of collaboration a lot of work uh, from all parties involved uh, I appreciate um, dr. Weber and her um, taking the time to, to uh, talk with us and work with the other law enforcement agencies. And in the end, I think that um, uh, that coupled with uh, um, Senate Bill 230, which the governor just signed last week, is um, going to, we, we in California are going to set the standard. 
Um, I think it's important that uh, perhaps I read a few uh, numbers that came from a group called uh, Campaign Zero. It's their numbers, not ours, but uh, we thought they were uh, valuable numbers that we should be working with. And what uh, that report came out is that um, uh, only 30 out of the uh, 91 largest police departments in the nation requires an officer to intervene to stop an officer uh, from using excessive force. It's not our numbers. It came, it came from Campaign Zero. Um, 34 out of the 91 largest police uh, departments in the nation require officers to de-escalate situations when possible before use of force. That's staggering. I, I'm in California. I don't, I, for me, I don't even, I can't even comprehend that. But uh, the other thing that I think is important, the, the, the last one is only 15 of the 91 largest police departments in the nation uh, specify detailed reporting requirements when <coughs> use of force is made. Mm. We're in California. That just, I, I don't understand that. You're talking about nationwide. So I think what's uh, is, is amazing is with the over 500 law enforcement agencies in the state of California, now with the signing of 230, that mandates, that mandates that all agencies in the state of California operate under the same use of force standards. And if we have time, I can read them, but I know that we're, you know, we're limited on time. But uh, I think that's really, really important. We're all going to have the same use of force standards. Uh, we are all going to be mandated to have the same training on de-escalation, uh, uses of force, uh, reporting requirements, and everything else. We are leading the nation in uh, use of force policy uh, here in the state of California, and other states are going to follow our suit. I truly believe that, but uh, that, that is amazing. We, in law enforcement, on our, from our perspective, we feel actually the sense of pride because of the fact that we are leading the nation in that. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to circle back to something that um, Assemblymember uh, Weber has uh, alluded to a few times and also something that uh, she's been a big part of, and that's the Racial Identity Profiling Act. Um, so starting last year with the state's eight largest law enforcement agency, uh, uh, RIPA, the Racial Identity and Profiling Act, mandates the collection of data on perceived race as well as circumstances for this stop. Um, what do you expect we can learn from these data? Uh, and are there limitations? And what about challenges and lessons from the implementation in the largest agencies? Um, Pastor Boyd, you've been part of, uh, of the board. You're on the board. Do you want to start us off? I am uh, very excited about um, what the data will reveal, will reveal to us once it's analyzed. And we actually come back to see what percentage of those who are actually stopped um, and the reasons they're stopped and what goes on and what happens uh, as the stop uh, uh, begins to mature, materialize going forward. If we look at what goes on in New York, the state of New York, as it relates to the state of California, um, we can see that uh, there's a comparison between both states uh, in law enforcement. And if you would think that a person who, who gets stopped uh, and who actually goes on to some other point that may lead to an arrest, uh, it may involve um, the, the, a weapon or it may involve a, a knife or it may uh, involve contraband or what may involve some other matters. Um, but when you look at the statistics, the statistics do not bear that out. That, that does not be borne out. Uh, those who get stopped uh, in both uh, the state of New York and uh, in the state of California, a great percentage of them are frisked and, uh, and, and, and they're released beyond that. The percentage of things that happen that occur beyond that uh, are almost negligible. So when we begin to look at that, I think that, ha that, that will be uh, underscored and it will provide a tremendous amount of information for the Ripper Board to make recommendations back to the, the Assembly and others and that for that uh, to have its own effect and impact on law enforcement uh, across the state. Uh, so uh, that's important uh, to us. Um, when we actually begin to look at other matters too, uh, as a person is stopped, uh, and a person actually uh, becomes uh, incarcerated, 
uh, becomes arrested, and uh, after their arrest, what happens with them? Uh, I really admire a few things that happened uh, in the state that I thought were quite uh, innovative uh, in the city uh, and, and county of San Francisco. When Kamala Harris was the uh, district attorney, uh, a back on track program was uh, installed, uh, instituted, so that young uh, persons who were involved in that could get another chance, have another chance. Uh, similar events uh, took place uh, across the state of California as she later on became attorney general. But I think the Ripper Board uh, is going to do a, a tremendous job in helping us <coughs> to better understand uh, all those factors that underlay uh, arrest and will help us to understand whether or not there is implicit bias uh, going on. Uh, it will also help us to understand whether or not the biases that many suspect they are are actually uh, involved and engaged. We're just hoping that law enforcement agencies across the state will be real will be real responsible in the gathering of that, the data and making sure that it's entered correctly. And uh, after it is entered, then the analysis of that, I think, will help all of us out going forward. Prior, I didn't know we were going this way there. No, okay. <laughs> jumping back and forth. Uh, okay, prior to 953, you know, one of the, one of the uh, which is the racial profiling bill, uh, and, and very proud of the fact that California has mandated reporting, the only state that had manda has mandated reporting. Others had had suggestions and opportunity, and I know Obama tried to get mandating and could not, so California got it, so that's a good thing. You know, the hope is always with all of these things, it's not, not only just collecting the data that's there, but hopefully changing the behavior of individuals. Because normally, if you have to ask the question, why am I stopping this person? And you can't come up with a good answer other than I just want to see what's in the car, <laughs> you know, or I think they might have had something. That may somehow or other change people's behavior. Because now you have to check something, a box, or you have to say something. And where before you're just stopping, thinking you're good, doing, uh, that you're doing this effort, and you may not even be conscious of how many times you stop people. It's like, you know, if, you, if you're on a diet and you have to write everything down, you stop eating sometimes, you know, or even you stop writing, one or the other. Uh, you know, but, but you, you know, stop writing. But, 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 uh, but at least it makes you conscious of what you have to do, because so many things we do without a conscious effort. You know, you see something, you, you respond to it, rather than ask the questions, why? Why did I respond to this? I've gotten all these things, and at the end of the day, I checked that there was nothing. Why did you stop them? Well, I thought maybe they had this. I didn't have anybody filing a complaint. I didn't have any evidence or data that something was occurring, but just as a gut feeling, you wanted to make that stop. So I think, you know, more than anything we hope will happen from this is that we will begin to see a decline in stops. Uh, that will inform folks that there's a bias I have or something going on that I'm unaware of and I really need to change my behavior and get to the point where we, we do some different kinds of things. And all of these bills, 953 as well as 392, is really designed uh, not to do it, I got you, you know, you got the worst numbers, you got the worst numbers, but really designed to change people's behavior. So we get different outcomes from law enforcement and from the community as well. So, uh, so we're excited about that because we think there'll be some things people can learn that the various jurisdictions can learn about their own policing practices and how they're using their resources and whether or not uh, they're part of the problem or part of the solution, those kinds of things, as well as the communities can as well, because oftentimes community thinks that a whole lot is occurring and it really isn't. Maybe it's just occurring to them, because of things they do. So it helps to we'll get us that information because before that, people claimed they didn't have good data. They didn't have good information. They didn't know what was going on. And before we move forward, we need to know what's going on. Chief Talkman? Well, I'd like to address a couple things. So that uh, gut feeling um, stop, um, I think if that uh, is the perception of some, um, in my position as a chief and the oversight of a department, <laughs> Um, we analyze those stops, uh, and so I can just tell you from my perspective, and remember, I'm, I'm in this region, so, uh, but in my perspective, I, I don't see that. Uh, I see that, uh, you know, you have to have some sort of probable cause to make that stop, and or uh, you still are able to make a stop on reasonable suspicion. Reasonable suspicion is, is that you have enough articulable facts to uh, back up in your report that you must write to say, hey, I, I, I stopped uh, because I've seen that car in the area six times. I ran the plate. It comes, you know, from far away and it looks like they're casing out a neighborhood or whatever the case is. But um, so I don't really see that. But um, I think the uh, interesting thing with uh, the RIPA data, I spend a great deal of time uh, talking it up and trying to figure out because, you know, it started out with the top eight uh, agencies in the state. And so 
I think um, after the data is analyzed, it's 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 uh, it's going to paint a much different picture than the narrative that is being presented. That uh, you know, the cops are only stopping people because of, uh, and then you can fill in the blank why uh, you think that maybe they're stopping them. Uh, and so I, I spoke with, as an example, one of the top agencies, CHP, and the majority of their stops were made in the evening. Uh, tinted windows, uh, dark cars, you know, you make the stop, uh, so you can't really see who's in the car when you're following them. Uh, you, um, uh, like I already mentioned, most contacts with law enforcement are as a result of a call for service, not a proactive uh, approach. Um, so I think that the data is going to show that too. Uh, but I think it's also important that uh, data without context can be divisive because it just depends on how you use the data. Um, there is uh, a gap in some of the data in the RIPA where um, in the end result of uh, did you use force, uh, but there's nowhere, there's no narrative box to say why you use the specific force in the end. And so, uh, so that uh, when you pull the data, if you're just pulling the, the check boxes, so to speak, uh, that is going to, um, uh, well, you can use data any way you want, right? So I, I think it's important that we have the context in there. So I, there's, I think there's needs to be a little bit of tweaking and in the, in, in to make sure there's more uh, information and a little bit more narrative as to why uh, the, the stop took place. Um, and, it, you know, it's a learning curve. Every, where I started in law enforcement a long, long, long time ago, and what we do today is different. Uh, there's more paperwork. There's more things you have to write down. There's more data that has to be collected, and and so every time there's change, it's it's a it's a learning curve. And uh, I think with those eight agencies, at first it was it was tough. Um, CHP makes about uh, three million contacts uh, with with uh, whether it's car stop or what have you per year. Three million, and each one of those contact cards was taking them up to up to twelve minutes. So do the math. That's a lot of time. Uh, to fill these out. Now they're down to like roughly four to seven minutes. So, and it just becomes a thing that they do. And I think that that's what's going to happen. It's going to be a trickle throughout the state. It's just going to be what we do and we're going to be used to it. And it's going to, uh, we're going to be able to uh, do that. But uh, we want to make sure that uh, um, when that data is collected, that it's, that there's uh, some usable information and that has to be with the context. Uh, and the other thing with uh, the data is, uh, if I contact somebody, I go out of my way and I go contact somebody and um, um, I don't have their ID in my hand, there's some things I have to actually guess on. And uh, that's a, that's been a, an issue. Um, uh, believe it or not, we have to guess on age. If we don't have that information on an ID, we have to guess on age, uh, gender, race, uh, sexual orientation, those kind of things. Uh, and that's problematic with, with that data too, so that you know I'm going to have to Yes, and so whenever you have data that you may or may not be guessing on, uh, sometimes that, that may uh, skew it too. So I, I, those are really, really important uh, points. Uh, I think we're all going to get used to uh, capturing the data. I think when it goes up to the Department of Justice, I think it's going to uh, change some of the narrative. So, All right. Um, so we have some reforms. We have significant reforms here in California, like uh, realignment and Prop 47. Um, they have significantly reduced the uh, reliance on incarceration in California. And while research so far has not linked the reforms to any changes in violent crime, it has found some property crime like auto theft, car break-ins, and, and shoplifting went up as a, a result. And then we heard from Brandon today uh, about findings in this report to suggest that uh, we've seen notable reduce, uh, re reduction in arrest in the wake of these reforms as well. So. Um, with that in mind, I want to ask you, uh, do you think these reforms have worked? Um, is there need for changes in terms of state policy and or in terms of local implementation? I know you need to leave soon, uh, Dr. Weber, <laughs> so I'm going to start with don't, you, if you don't, don't mind, just spending a couple of minutes. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, um, we've heard a lot about the reforms, and um, it's sometimes it's slowed down a little bit because initially, we got lots of responses from people who believe that crime had gone up, that things had happened as a result of so many people not going to prison and so forth and so on. 
And slowly but surely, that, 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 that narrative is going down because obviously the data doesn't bear that out, that, uh, that, uh, our, that Prop 47 and, and many of the things that came as a result of it has not necessarily made us any less safe and has not in any way increased the crime rate in, in most of our communities. So I think in some sense it has worked because, um, you know, we, and we have a long way to go. I want to emphasize that because, you know, when you spend 40, 30, 40 years spending your whole, your whole focus is incarceration. Uh, and you've got, and you've developed the largest uh, prison system in the world. Uh, you know, where you've gone from 20,000 to 180,000 people in prison, you know, 30, 40 year span. I mean, that, that, that is a huge organization to start talking about changing the behavior, changing people's uh, uh, expectations and those kinds of things. And so we've now taken off about, I think, 40 or 45,000 out of our prisons now. And so we still have a large number. We still have the largest prison system in the world. Um, and so as a result, this is, this is demonstrating to us, I think, that we can do something different than constantly incarcerating people. I know that many folks, uh, as a result of that, have, are not, you're not having as many folks with uh, addictions um, and being incarcerated, but being sent off to other places. The, the community courts, the collaborative courts are, are working, law enforcement is working with collaborative courts. So I think it's forcing us, all of these initiatives, are, which came out of the people, uh, the people voted for this, uh, that they wanted it because of the, what they saw, uh, as a result, will force all of us to think about how we exist and what we use law enforcement for in terms of support, but also as a legislature, it makes it, it very clear to us that we have to fund rehabilitation. Uh, and we changed the title of the agency to uh, CDCR because we wanted to add the rehabilitation in it. We changed our reasons for incarceration from simply saying for punishment, but also adding also for rehabilitation and, to, and for public safety. So we're trying to change the philosophy and the behavior so that we end up with fewer folks on the prison uh, pipeline trail. And of course, we have to change our school system, which is you know, the main force that, that has a tendency to, to basically prepare our children for incarceration. Um, but, um, but I think that they're working. I mean, I, I, I think we haven't, I don't feel any, any greater sense of harm. Uh, most folks don't. And yet we have fewer piece of people in prison than we had uh, four or five years ago. And if we keep working at it, we'll get to a point where we realize that those who are in prison really deserve to be there for whatever reason and that those who have other issues that could have been sent in a different direction, we will see that. Uh, we've stopped even incarcerating so many of our young people. You know, we've gone for from like 10,000 young people down about 700 that are in our juvenile justice system. So, which is important because those are the people who, that we were actually preparing to take over the beds in the prisons. Uh, and, and now we're, we're going in a different direction. So, uh, what brought I see from Prop 47, and I know there's always initiative hiding around the corner to unravel it, um, is that um, all the fears that we once had that this was going to be absolutely horrible and we were going to have everybody in our streets running around raping and killing everyone has not happened. And, and that's a good thing. Uh, that's a good thing because that means we can take resources and put them into building people's lives rather than simply destroying them. Thank you. Chief? So there's um, AB 109 and Prop 47. Those are the two uh, initiatives. And um, so there's a couple of layers that I think it's important to discuss. Um, so what what the first initiative did is, is that it changed what became a violent felony. And so instead of going to prison for these uh, crimes, you go to county jail. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of them because there's 13 of them, but uh, I'll be happy to answer because I don't want to take up a ton of time. But um, human trafficking of a child, that is a nonviolent felony. Abducting a minor for prostitution, nonviolent. Rape of intox uh, by intoxication is a nonviolent felony. A felony assault using force likely to produce great bodily injury is a nonviolent felony. So those people go to that commit these crimes or convicted of them go to county jail. They don't go to prison. Uh, the people that were in county jails are now out on the street and doing work programs. And I, I'm not opposed to that piece because uh, a lot of times, you know, if you can get back in working in society and stuff and you're not spending time in county jail, that that's a good thing. So, but the other thing that we've noticed in law enforcement is uh, through Prop 47. So the retailers aren't reporting crimes. There's corporate policies that say don't report the crimes, allow those people to leave the store uh, because it's not worth it because they're not going to go to prison for the merchandise that they've stole. Uh, one major corporation in the state of California has lost uh, an additional $14 million last year in revenue 
our, our loss uh, because of the thefts that the additional thefts that are taking place. And so I think that uh, uh, we and we all pay for that. Um, and then the other piece is that really is near and dear to my heart because of addiction in my own family. Um, so what used to be a felony, if you were arrested for, let's say you had possession of methamphetamine and you went to uh, the court and because uh, you were arrested for that felony, it's a wobbler. Uh, the judge can determine if it's a misdemeanor or a felony, but uh, what they had to do is they had to offer you rehabilitation uh, drug court. They had to give you an uh, uh, opportunity to do that. Um, now they're not going to court. What happens is that if I arrest you for possession of methamphetamine, I, I take your methamphetamine from you and then I give you a ticket and send you on your way. So what happens is, is that I, if I'm addicted to drugs, then that cop just took my methamphetamine and I want to get more because I had it in my possession to use it. So I'm going to go get some more. Uh, so the drug dealers are loving this law. Uh, this is my perspective as a law enforcement uh, uh, professional and uh, because it's increasing their sales. Uh, and so the, and, but besides that, the bigger issue is, is that if I'm addicted to drugs, I never get the opportunity. So if you are an, if you're an addict, you need assistance. You need help to get past that addiction. And you, and if you're not if you're on the streets uh, and constantly in a chemical state, you never get an opportunity to get clean and sober. Uh, in calling agencies throughout the state in preparation for this event, um, my counterparts in Southern California wanted me to to uh, really really. Um, hammer this point home is is that their um, calls for service related to mental illness and homelessness and drug related issues is so is something they've never seen before. It's an epidemic in Southern California, and um, a lot of these folks would be the ones that would hopefully get some sort of opportunity for rehabilitation, and uh, they're just not getting that. And so. Um, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done on us as a society. And when I say society, I think law enforcement is, a, is part of that. And we should be part of the conversation where how are we going to provide that mental health and addiction treatment, get out to the folks that are out there um, that are, are, are suffering from that. And I think that that uh, is one of the negative side effects of uh, Prop 47. So, and I, again, it's near and dear to my heart because there's addiction in my own family. And so uh, I want to make I, I, I want my own family to be able to get that support that they need to. So I'm going to have to leave, but I have to respond. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're here. We're here for a debate. Only, it's OK. Only, not, to, yeah. only to say that, um, you know, our recidivism rate is was it like 70 percent people coming back into prison. So. Uh, those who are addicted, most folks know, and, 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 and we see this even in our public safety committee, that, you know, folks are getting more drugs in prison than they're probably getting on the streets. So us incarcerating them did not in any way turn out to be some wonderful experience that they would basically de de go and, and, and get rid of their addiction. Uh, many of them came out with even more addictions. And so we've been wrestling with that at the, at the, at the finance portion of it because we've got, we're trying to figure out how the stuff is getting in and we're discovering that it's getting in through the people who work there. And so this is an ongoing challenge uh, as to how we're going to deal with this, particularly in our prisons uh, that are there, and we've got, uh, and so it's it's an ongoing thing that's there. But it would be wrong to believe that while we were incarcerating all these people, we were actually doing a good work, that we were actually saving lives, rehabilitating individuals, and what have you. Because what we saw is our prisons were full, and they were getting fuller, and and the rehabilitation was not occurring. People going out, coming right back in, seventy percent of them coming right back. So we had to change what we're doing in these places. Uh, what if we if they're there, we got to figure out how to rehabilitate them. If they're addicted, we need to put them in some other system, and I think that's a part of it, so that they can get the help that they need. But um, but our 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 our, our system that we had uh, was not would, was basically not supporting the goals of a civilized group of people. That you got that many people in prison who go out and come back in. It's a revolving door, and we have to do something because the purpose of putting them there is, we hope, is not only to make us safe from them, but to make them citizens who come back and be productive citizens. And, and it's a long journey. It's a long journey, but uh, you know, I know, uh, well, we, we deal with those in the legislature who believe we should incarcerate no matter what, all over and over again, and uh, with the, with the, without any recognition that what we had done and still do in terms of financing it uh, has not in any way made us better as a state. 
I probably um, should have put my two points together though. Yeah. Okay. My two points were is that was the that was the avenue that we had so right. we can get them uh, some sort of treatment. But we weren't uh, getting but them my, treatment. But my second my second point was is that we have to work on a way to get out to them no where question. they are uh, to get rehabilitation because yes. the reality is is that if. Uh, because of the addiction, if there's theft or whatever that's going on because they need to support right. their addiction, uh, they also have to remember that there are victims out there that uh, if it's a property crime or a person crime, mm -hmm. you know, there's still victims out there. And, sure. and in our world, when we uh, find somebody that has some, a lot of times committed a violent crime, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of times there's alcohol and drugs on board uh, when they're committing sure, those sure. acts too. So, uh, so that, those were my two points. And I, like I said, I probably should have put them closer <laughs> together because then, you know. Uh, well, and that's fine. I just wanted to make sure we understood we didn't have a perfect system that was working at all. Uh, that uh, need, reform was needed. We're a long way from where we want to be. I think we all agree at some point that those who are addicted to various uh, uh, substances are really ill and need help. And, uh, and part of the, that whole issue should be making sure that we do that. And I know at, at the state level we're trying to do the funding for it and some other things to make sure that those beds are available, that people get the help they need. Because before, we were not doing that. They were going out, spending their time in prison, coming right back, and then going home, coming right back again. And it was a revolving door without any real serious support, and even without even an attitude that we needed to try to rescue these folks' lives, rather than let them constantly going out and coming back in worse conditions than it in the first place. I've enjoyed being with you guys. I'm supposed to be on a curriculum committee, so thank, thank you very much. Weather. Uh um, I don't want to uh, rob Pastor Boyd of an opportunity to uh, uh, reply to my uh, question here, and then we're going to move into, we, we'll have a little bit of time for a few questions at least. So, Pastor Boyd. Let me respond to um, the notion of what is um, violent and what is nonviolent. Um, as it relates to um, uh, human trafficking or other matters that, that the state and that the legislature sees as being uh, um, uh, nonviolent, um, if we look back at um, a person who's victimized uh, by human trafficking, if you look at a person who's victimized uh, by a person who uh, uh, perpetrates on them a, a sexual act, um, or, or at least involving them in sexual trafficking, trafficking. Um, the perpetrator may not have acted violently in his or her act, but the person who is the victim of that will certainly carry mental, psychological, and emotional scars long time in their lives, just as much so if they had been actually physically accosted uh, in a particular uh, event. Um, Dr. Michelle uh, Alexander, in her book, uh, the New Jim Crow talks about how the disparity between uh, African Americans and other races in the country uh, end up incarcerated, and how there has become now a new slavery, a uh, new Jim Crow environment being created within the uh, justice system, uh, where there's a school to uh, prison pipeline being uh, created. And a lot of that uh, takes uh, place because of the, the way the arrest patterns uh, take place. And many times when a person is stopped and, and arrested and, and and finally uh, gets uh, 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 put uh, in jail or incarcerated uh, for a period of time. If they are in that uh, institution for um, a, a period of time and they are now subject to bail, uh, many of them in African American low income communities cannot afford the bail to come out of the situation and will have to uh, uh, go to a bail bonds person and may not economically be able to go to a bail bonds person and have their bail um, uh, re re paid for uh, a put up. So that person then has to stay incarcerated until they're brought up for trial. So that, that pre-trial confinement is a very valid uh, period in that person's life. And if that person uh, who actually um, uh, cannot afford bail and cannot get out, they're, they're detained. And there is um, a cultural impact that takes place uh, from within the uh, confinement institution. And persons come out, uh, or at least begin to now to act like those who are inside of that institution uh, over a period of time. And uh, when you actually come up for trial, uh, if you could afford bail uh, on your own or if you've got a bail bonds person to bail you out, you have time to get proper counsel. You have time to go to community organizations and churches and mosques and other places to get letters of reference and to get some support. You bring that back into a court situation 
then then certainly a jurist will look at that uh, and, and give it some merit, give it some weight. However, if you're incarcerated and cannot afford bail, then you stay there uh, until your trial comes up. When you come up for trial, you're wearing an orange uh, uh, jail suit when you come to trial, and you look like a criminal. You look at the institution that you have been involved in from the time of your arrest, and you certainly make no vivid positive impression on any uh, judge, any member of the court. However, if you could afford bail and uh, or you could actually uh, do it on your own or uh, with the assistance of a bail bonds person, then certainly you're able to be looked at in a different light and you'll come out uh, in a different way. So because of the economic disparities that, that take place and because of the abject uh, wide um, chasm of uh, difference between African-American and low-income uh, community members as opposed to those who are, uh, who are uh, from other communities, uh, that wide gap and that wide disparity is, is, is very uh, damaging on, on the African-American community. And as a result of that, it comes back to heighten uh, the uh, notions that are contained and Dr. Alexander's book, uh, The New Jim Crow, and also come back to reflect where we are today. Today, African Americans make up 6.5% of the state of California population, yet we are 60, we're 37% of uh, uh, population of the population and those who are incarcerated, among those who are incarcerated across the state, 37% as opposed to 65 So somewhere we have to find a way to uh, make uh, the legislative changes that need to be made. Uh, and then the data we collect from our RIPA uh, engagement uh, do the, and the conversations we have from law enforcement, between law enforcement uh, and uh, local members of community, leaders in the community, and, uh, and, and institutions within the community. Those things are important, and as the dialogue continues, as the sensitivities uh, continue, uh, and as the changes that we uh, all make together uh, continue, then that's going to be a, a tremendous uh, ena enablement. Uh, if you're African-American, you're perceived that you're going to be stopped more than uh, a non-African-American. That's just plain and simple. Uh, I get stories all the time of people who are actually African-Americans who, and especially young black men uh, who, who are African-American, they get stopped uh, disproportionately more than, than others. And so the implicit bias that might be lived out in that, even if it's no more than in the person's mind, uh, that, that's a reality. And that causes harm and that causes some emotional uh, uh, tension within the community. However, when the, when the data comes back to us, the data comes back, we are able to look at it and, and see uh, what is in fact going on by action. I think a lot of that uh, can be either underscored and, and proven to be right, or it can be proven to be wrong, and we can change our ways and begin to move on to, to a better day. So I'm happy about the uh, um, uh, number, the, the crime rate in the state is going down. I'm very happy about the fact that there are fewer persons uh, in prison today than there were a few years ago, but the disparity between those who are there, the, the, that disparity is still uh, a tremendous gap between the African-American low-income communities uh, from the non-African-American and other communities. So I work on this, I dialogue together, uh, and, and uh, the sensitivity that we all go through, I think is all important. Every one of us have a role and responsibility to play in that. Thank you. Can I say one more thing on that? Um, I, what, it, I swear it'll take just one second. One that, second. That's why this is important, because I think that we have to have these dialogues. Uh, it's okay to have a difference of opinion. Uh, it's a different uh, uh, thought. It's important to have these conversations um, so that we can better understand um, perceptions, feelings, uh, uh, someone's world that they live in. I mean, these are all truly important. And uh, that, what, that's what ha is happening in each, that I'm, the, uh, the groups that I'm working with and the uh, uh, chiefs that I know, that's what's happening at the, in the individual levels at the different uh, cities, uh, having those dialogues to, to help uh, try to be have a better understanding. Uh, and then when this data comes out, um, we can really look at it and analyze it and say, uh, is what our per, what we believe to be true true, or is it something that uh, uh, is worse or better, or or what is it? I think that that's is going to be crucial to be able to really analyze that data properly. All right, we've got time for just a couple of questions. So if anyone has some, we have uh, mics microphones here. Uh, so just wait. Till you have a microphone in your hand before you ask your questions, this, this is being taped. 
Hi, um, I first want to take a moment to thank you both for um, sharing your words of wisdom with us today and your information and your knowledge. I had a quick question towards um, Chief Sockman. Um, so you mentioned earlier that a lot of the arrests that you're seeing are due to direct calls from community members. Um, and so I know for me personally, I've seen on social media and on the news that there's been instances where um, community members have been calling the cops on people because of certain things. Um, for exa example, in Oakland, there was a woman that called the police on a community of African Americans who were celebrating whatever in the park. And there's also been a case in the Bay Area that um, a black couple got the cops called on them from um, a neighbor while they were renting an Airbnb. And so I guess my question is, has there been discussions regarding how to handle those type of things? Because we are seeing that cops getting called on someone has been someone's way of, of either fear tactic or um, some sort of a threat when they're in a, a conversation that they're, they're not winning or they're just disagreeing. And so I, I want to know if law enforcement have began to have those dialogues about how to appropriately address those situations, especially when we're seeing the, the, the data and the statistics that we've seen today. We're seeing that you know there are higher arrests for people of African-American um, um, ethnicity. So I want to know, are we talking about that in your spaces? What does that look like? And as community members ourselves, how can we help you to figure out how to better address those situations? That's a great question. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, so yes, uh, people do call and yes, we do respond. And yes, sometimes it's uh, the person that's making that call's own personal bias uh, in their calls, but we still go respond. And I think that the important piece to that conversation is how we respond. Um, how do we go out and make contact? And it's both ways. Uh, so uh, with the groups that I work with, um, you know, most of uh, the um, issues that the groups that I work with have with law enforcement, actually, uh, I feel very blessed, uh, happen with contacts in other cities, and then they move to my city and they don't have that same issue. Uh, so it's one city at a time. It's one department at a time. We have to uh, make sure that we are training our officers um, to uh, treat everybody with dignity and respect. I believe that we do a good job of that. This is my own personal feeling. Um, and then it's the same thing on the other end. Uh, so if, uh, if I'm a young man and I'm in the park and I feel like I'm always getting harassed every single time, I'm probably going to resent the fact that the police are showing up because uh, I'm not doing anything wrong. And I know that I'm not doing anything wrong. The cops still got to go out and respond to that call and answer that call for service. Uh, so if we can have through those relationships and through those conversations and through uh, what is being uh, talked about in these groups and in the media and everything else to show that we're not, it, it, they're good interactions, I think that that'll change the narrative. Uh, I think that'll change the reactions. Um, I think that will change um, uh, some of the perceptions. Um, but unfortunately, no matter how hard we try, and no matter how hard uh, through those relationships uh, that start to improve, uh, things get better, I'm not gonna change that person that made that phone call. Uh, I'm, not, I'm probably not gonna be able to get through them as quickly as I can through uh, the, the different groups that we're doing right now. So, uh, so all I can tell you is that in, in law enforcement, we're gonna continue to try, uh, continue to work with, and continue to respond in a professional manner, because that's the best that we can do. We can't stop somebody from making those calls, so something that meant sorry even if they have like a prior or a warrant because i know that was also something that is probable cause for an arrest so in the instance that someone does have the police call on them you run the information you run you find that there is a warrant but the reason for the call had nothing to do with the crime is there conversation about how to handle that situation so that's a good question too so when a judge issues a warrant and says that you must arrest it doesn't we have no discretion so if we run somebody and find out they have a warrant, there is no, we don't have discretion. If, if, if it says you can um, release them on a citation in the warrant, we can do that. Uh, but if it says uh, 
no OR, uh, mandatory appearance. Um, you have to understand, we have to take you to jail. Um, now, what happens when you get to the jail? If, if, if they give you a citation and send you on your way, then that's what the jail does. But from a field perspective, uh, we have to make that arrest. It's kind of like uh, domestic violence. Uh, if there's domestic violence uh, and there's a primary aggressor and there's injury, somebody's going to jail. It's mandatory by law. And uh, so, so that, there's, there's no discretion there. Uh, I did read that in a report too, you know, where the discretion on the police officers to make arrest. If it's a felony, you make an arrest. If it's a misdemeanor, there are options. You know, you, there's some things that are citable and stuff like that. But when you're talking about warrants specifically, it depends on what it says in the warrant itself. All right, let's take one more question back there. Sure, I'll make this quick. Um, should we be looking at, uh, uh, as one of the cohorts of, of data you're collecting, homelessness and its impact on some of the crime and rest rates that we're seeing across the state, especially in counties that have high poverty rates? And given the nature that the homeless people usually don't have cell phones on them, they won't be making service calls about a crime. You want to take? Yeah. Homelessness, homelessness is not a crime. Uh, that just happens to be a human human uh, situation that results from some other matters, cause and effect up top. If you're a homeless person and commit a particular crime, as a law enforcement officer comes and, and does what a law enforcement officer does when they uh, discover crime has been made, and the uh, persons who may be subject to that crime, that's another matter. But as it, as it relates to uh, homelessness, that, that really is not a crime. But I think the, a, a lot of the things that happen uh, uh, in the whole, uh, that might not be a question, but. So it, it, he's right. Homelessness is not a crime. These are human beings. Um, there are a percentage of homeless that have um, financial difficulties and they don't have a home. There are also uh, homeless that have mental illness and there are homeless that have drug addiction and chemical dependency and uh, or and or a combination of two or three of those factors and so when we are responding to um, homeless calls for service which i up and down the state have increased tenfold on the calls for service um, we just like the previous question we respond we assess and we try to figure out if there is something that we can do um, i can tell you from this region we spend a great deal of time with outreach workers and mental health outreach workers and trying to uh, get them the help that they need because that's what really it is. <clears throat> Homelessness is a societal issue. It's a community issue. It's a state issue. It is not a law enforcement issue. The acts that occur because of the chemical dependency or the mental illness, uh, which drew us to there, if there's a crime committed, then we, then again, like I discussed before, we are going to act in some manner, but our ultimate goal is to try to get that person help because Quite honestly, the, the, there are a certain number of homeless that, that are the majority of our calls. Not all, just some, and those are the majority of our calls, and they're repeat. And we go out, and if we've been out with them 10 times, we really like to get them the help that they need uh, because they're with drugs. Uh, if any of you have been around people that are addicted to drugs, uh, there's going to be a point where they've been awake for a number of days, uh, the psychosis kicks in and, and you're going to be trying to reason with somebody that isn't really, uh, unfortunately, not there mentally. And uh, so there is no reasoning. And so this, this de-escalation and trying to talk them down and trying to get their attention, it takes time. It takes relationships um, to, tr to try to uh, de-escalate this properly without uh, having to go hands on and use force. And so the, so we're, we're trying to do is trying to get them help before that uh, that episode kicks in. And then we as a society, I truly believe, this is just Todd Sockman speaking, I wish that there was more effort in the mental health outreach in the field, not brick and mortar buildings, in the field, getting people out there, making contact with and helping uh, to get uh, the treatment that they need if they have mental illness and the addiction counseling and to get better um, for those that have chemical or, or alcohol dependency. I right. may make an attempt to kind of pull this together. Um, Dr. Weber, when she was here, represented uh, uh, law, 
and, uh, and policy. Um, the chief represents law enforcement. Uh, I from, come from a community where uh, the impacts uh, actually rest. Um, when you actually look at homeless persons, some of them may have substance addiction problems. Some of them may have emotional, psychological problems. But one thing we can all agree, all of them have an economic problem at the bottom line. So what causes the economic problem? Perhaps it is the disproportionate assessment or management rather of the economic wealth and strength at the top of the pyramid and a lessening of that at the bottom of the pyramid. You can't begin to imagine the number of people who come by my office, uh, who I come in contact with on a weekly basis, who are about to lose or have already lost their job and about to lose or have already lost their apartment or their home. And the only thing they have is perhaps a camper or a van or a car that they're sleeping in. At that point in time, emotionally and psychologically, they're okay uh, in, in a mental state. Uh, if they had a little counseling and, and a re readmission into a job, then they would everything would change radically. But for them at that point in time, they, they're, they're wits in. So to, in order to survive, they have to take on the behavior of the homeless population as a whole. And so when they do that, just taking alcohol or taking drugs just to survive uh, the brutality of being a part of the homeless, whether you sleep in the car or sleeping in a cardboard box under uh, a building or under a freeway overpass, those things are tremendous impacts on them. So that begins to proliferate. So the homelessness population begins to proliferate. Uh, downtown San Francisco, downtown a lot Los Angeles, downtown San Diego, completely across the state, in many other parts of the country. It's not just a California thing, but it's it's a it's a national uh, matter we're dealing with. So if if we can find a way to bring uh, the enforcement, the legislative part, and the community part in a dialogue that helps us to untie some of these things that that actually cause an increase in uh, incarceration, that cause an increase uh, and the, in the things that proliferate uh, a person out of uh, a, a regular stable uh, environment and a home and a family out into a situation of homelessness. If we can stop that, if we can mitigate the problems that somehow or another cause that, I think all of us would be better off in the long run. And we wouldn't have to have the intensity of these conversations. We can be talking about other conversations that take us from a better world, um, from this world to a better world and better environment. All right. Well, unfortunately, we are in, out of time here, and we'll have to end this very uh, good uh, and informative discussion I think that we've had here. Um, I want to thank uh, our panelists for being part of it, and I want to thank you all for coming here today and look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, good, good. 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 good.